you know, it's kind of interesting that the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Fauci was a national hero and everyone concerned and coming together in the United States, massive economic plan. And in relatively short order, things get really politicized and not just in the U.S., of course, but also around the world, the world more divided on the back of the pandemic, not less. Um, the United States more divided on the back of the pandemic, not less. What lessons didn't we learn as a consequence of COVID? How do we look at COVID and the pandemic differently through a, a lens of geopolitics and international relations than we are the Russia-Ukraine crisis that we see right now? Anne-Marie, you want to start? Yes, and I do have to say, uh, Ian, uh, folks who really want the answer to that question should read your fabulous new book <laughs> about crises that we can use and crises that we can't. Uh, I think one of the lessons we learned, and perhaps it was predictable, but a pandemic that is relatively slow rolling. This was not Ebola. Uh, this was a, this was a, it was, is a virus that has killed millions of people, uh, but that at the same time, people could say for quite a long time, and even now in the United States, it's like an intense case of the flu. That doesn't provide the, that kind of crisis moment where people have to pull together, like the crash of 2008, you know, where Obama is able to get the world together in the G20 and by 2009 to say we have to do something right now, like the war in Ukraine, where there's an immediate issue and you, you, you have to respond in real time. This was too complex, hitting different countries in different ways, every country, of course, responding in, in its own way. There is certainly more that could have been done had Trump been willing to get together with the Chinese and others uh, and the WHO at the outset. But at the outset, we didn't know enough about the virus. So I think one of the big lessons here is if you're going to use a crisis effectively for change, you have to be able to have the right time horizon, the right group of countries, and a very specific set of goals. It is possible that we will be able to do that now with respect to kind of building a better global health infrastructure, but then the sense of urgency, although it should be there, is already is not. draining away. Except for in the Chinese case, where there's a lot more urgency but a lot more anger and unwillingness to cooperate with the United States and the West. Exactly. And honestly, the United States bears responsibility for that, or I should say bears some responsibility. We refuse to work with the Chinese to, to vaccinate the world. The Chinese vaccine is not nearly as good as the Western vaccines, but it's better than no vaccine. And had the United States said the priority for the global economy, for the global health system, uh, for humanity generally is to vaccinate the whole world and we're gonna bring India and China and the Europeans uh, and us together to do it, we really would have had a far better shot. We didn't, we rebuffed all Xi's attempts. Maybe they were faints, maybe they weren't. Uh, and China is now much less willing to cooperate with us. Steve, credible? I mean, of course, the Chinese were lying for the first several weeks about whether or not there even was such a thing as COVID and lied to the WHO and their own people. Do you think there was really an opportunity for the West, for the Americans to work with the Chinese in terms of uh, global COVID response? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, one of the unfortunate things is you had uh, essentially a lot of the wrong leaders in a lot of the wrong places at exactly the wrong time. So I can easily imagine a different set of people in China, in the United States, in a number of other countries uh, coordinating a much more effective global response to this. What I find really surprising about COVID is that it's run counter, at least in some countries, to our normal expectation. Our normal expectation is that when a crisis hits, the authority of the estate goes up. Think of what happens in a war, right? The economies get mobilized, prices get controlled, uh, you know, people get drafted. It, and popularity goes up. And popularity goes up. Yeah. And you've got, you got some of that. you got some of that response everywhere. Governments trying to do more, trying to impose rules, limiting travel, things like that. But remarkably quickly, that began to dissipate. 
you began to see challenges to state authority, certainly in the United States, but also uh, elsewhere in some other countries as well. And of course, that undermined the ability to respond uh, to, the, to the pandemic as effectively as we could have. And the second thing that I think is instructive about this is it is always difficult at the global level to get people to make sacrifices on behalf of others. You know, people wanted to keep the vaccines at home for their own populations first before they shared them, even though the problem was simply going to continue if the virus could continue to mutate someplace else. It was eventually going to go from South Africa to the West and we'd be dealing with it again. It's hard to get them to do uh, things in the collective interest rather than self-interest. And it's hard to get people to make sacrifices in the short term to deal with a problem over the longer term. And that's, I think, the future problem we're gonna face is, you know, yes, post COVID we'll say, well, let's have a better plan in place for the next one. And my concern is that interest and commitment to maintaining those preparations will dissipate if we get five or 10 years where nothing bad happens. And then suddenly the next virus, maybe a worse virus comes along and we'll be back in the same problem we've had this, this time around.